The following presentation is brought to you by Discovery Education, leading the world of digital and video learning. Discovery Education, connect to a world of learning. It's been three weeks of grand Egyptian adventure for Atet and his brothers. They're with their dad on a boat trip down the Nile River to deliver some important scrolls to Pharaoh Ramses II. Since Atet is missing scribe school, his teacher told him to keep a journal about his trip. Dear journal, I can't wait to tell you about the day we just had. See those pyramids behind me? Pretty fantastic, huh? We spent the whole day exploring them. And I'm here to tell you, they're even more fantastic in person. For one thing, they aren't just big, they are enormous. Dad says that they are as tall as 50 Egyptian houses stacked on top of each other. I think that they are even taller than that. Not only that, but Dad says that the pyramids are aligned perfectly to the north, south, east, and west. Now in our modern day, we could do that easily. After all, we are very advanced here in the time of Pharaoh Ramses. But these pyramids are old, way older than my granddad's great-granddad. They were built more than 1,000 years before I was born. If that isn't old, I don't know what is. While we were looking around the pyramids, I couldn't help but wonder, why were they built? Well, Dad told me the pyramids are basically giant tombs. Remember Osiris, Lord of the Next World? We Egyptians think that when people die, they are just passing over into the other world to join Osiris. So it's important to send them off the best way we know how. First we wrap them up to preserve their bodies, and then we bury them with all kinds of good things they would need in the next life, like food, games, clothing, or scrolls. Simple people have simple tombs, but the pharaohs want to continue to live a rich life on the other side. They like to take a lot of their treasures with them. All that gold and jewelry is pretty tempting for a thief. So the pharaohs kept making bigger and more complicated tombs to try to trick the robbers. But there's another reason for the pyramids too. Our pharaohs are god kings. We count on them to rule here on earth, to organize our cities and towns, to lead our armies, and to build our temples. But one of the most important things the pharaohs do is communicate with the gods on our behalf. The pyramids are aligned, so their tips point directly up into the center of the heavens. This is to help the pharaohs reach the gods and put in a good word for us. Dad says it took a lot of trial and error to figure out how to build the pyramids. A really long time ago, pharaohs were buried in a tomb like this. It's called a mastaba, a word meaning bench. Mastabas were made of mud brick, just like our houses. They were just fine for pharaohs for hundreds of years. But by the time Pharaoh Zoser ruled, Egypt had grown to be a powerful and rich country. People must have thought that Pharaoh needed a bigger, better tomb. Lucky for Pharaoh Zoser, he had a really smart man working for him. Imhotep was Zoser's top advisor. He was also the chief physician and the royal architect. Dad says Imhotep changed the world forever. He had the idea to build the pyramids with stone instead of mud brick. Imhotep's pyramid for Zoser started out as a giant mastaba with smaller mastabas stacked on top. 
Because he used stones, Imhotep was able to stack a lot higher than he could with mud brick. His step pyramid is almost 200 feet high. Dad says this was the biggest building back then, 10 times taller than anything else around. Pharaoh Sneferu was just a kid when the step pyramid was built. As soon as he became Pharaoh, he started building his own pyramid. Good thing he didn't give up easily. It took a lot of practice to design the perfect pyramid. Sneferu's first attempt failed when workmen put smooth limestone blocks on the outside walls. The blocks weren't attached too well and slid right off. So, Sneferu built the second pyramid. This time, the architect, who was Sneferu's son, by the way, used larger blocks for the outside walls. These stayed on much better. But soon, the walls began to crack because the pyramid was built on shifting gravel and sand. Halfway up, they changed the angle, but it was still too unstable, so Sneferu abandoned the bent pyramid, too. Sneferu's last pyramid was smaller than the first two, and the angle of the slope was reduced, but it was a complete success. They called it the Shining Pyramid. The pyramids at Giza were built by Sneferu's son and grandsons. It's easy to see how much they learned from their dad's early design mistakes. But as we explore today, I realize that it took something besides good design to build the pyramids. It took a lot of effort. See the Great Pyramid? It's made of more than two million blocks of stone. Dad told me each block weighs at least two and a half tons, as much as a full-grown elephant. Some blocks near the bottom weigh as much as 15 tons. That's nearly seven elephants. Dad told me the Great Pyramid took 23 years to build. 23 years divided by two million blocks. That means that they had to move a block at least as heavy as an elephant every few minutes. Not only was moving the stones amazing, but they fit together perfectly. All of these years later, and you still can't slide a piece of papyrus in there. That's some very careful work. And when they built it, they had to keep it aligned all the way to the top. If one side was off by even an inch, the points of the top would line up. But they do line up because the people who designed and built the pyramids were master craftsmen. So, who were the master pyramid builders? Why, we Egyptians, of course. Dad says that more than 100,000 men worked on the Great Pyramid. 20,000 peasants at a time would come, usually during the season of the flood. They were called by the Pharaoh to do their civic duty for Egypt. Every family had to send someone. They lived and worked in gangs of a hundred, divided into groups of ten. Can you imagine organizing everything for the workers every day? Think about it. Twenty thousand people needed a place to sleep, food to eat, and clean clothes to wear. Dad says the job of organizing the workers for the pyramids was nearly as hard as the job of building them. The pyramids make me really proud to be an Egyptian. It's been over a week since I've written. Yesterday we left Pharaoh Ramsey's palace, and now we're heading home. This has been a fun trip, and I can't wait to tell Mom all about it. Of course, I'm sure Mom has her own stories to tell. She helps take care of the house, and is also a priestess for the goddess Tator. She helps ladies have healthy babies. It's a hard job. Most Egyptian babies die before they are one year old so parents see their children as blessings. Both my mother and father have very important jobs. Dad, as you know, is a scribe, but he's also a priest at the Temple of Karnak. Priests are appointed by the Pharaoh or inherit the job from their fathers. 
We believe that the gods create and control the universe. The Pharaoh rules over us and talks with the gods on our behalf. But the Pharaoh can't be everywhere at once, so he has priests to help him out. Three times a year, Dad goes to live at a temple for a whole month. Priests need to be clean and pure, so they spend a lot of time bathing in the special pools. Sometimes they wash four times a day. While they're at the temple, the priests make daily offerings to the gods and preside over other special ceremonies. When Dad isn't at the temple, he lives at home with us. It's important for priests to have other jobs too, because they are responsible for helping Egypt run smoothly. Egyptian society is organized kind of like a pyramid. The pharaoh and his family are at the top. When a pharaoh dies, the position usually is passed down to his oldest son or nephew. Pharaohs from the same family make what's called a dynasty. Under the pharaoh are the viziers, priests, and scribes. They oversee the day-to-day -day activities of the country. After the priests and scribes come the craftsmen and artists, stonemasons and laborers, farmers, then servants, and finally there are slaves. They have to work very hard, and a lot of them are very far away from home. Speaking of far from home, I haven't told you much about our neighbors, have I? There are a lot of other countries besides Egypt. Most of the time, we're good neighbors. We trade our food for the things that they have that we don't have. Up here to the north is where we get cedar trees to make our big boats. Here to the east is where we get our turquoise, copper, and other metals. Usually Egypt is pretty well protected from enemies by the desert and the Nile's cataracts or waterfalls. But once, a few hundred years ago, we were invaded by the Hyksos from up north. They came in horses and things called chariots, which we had never seen before. The Hyksos overthrew our pharaoh and ruled us for 150 years until we finally threw them out. The only good thing to come out of that experience was that we learned how to make chariots and raise horses ourselves. So the next time we had to fight, we were ready. Way up to the north are the Hittites. Pharaoh Ramses had a famous battle with them near the town of Kadesh. For years after that, Ramses and the Hittites battled over towns all along the coast. Finally, they agreed to stop fighting. It was the first peace treaty in human history. Ramses even married the Hittite king's daughter. South along the Nile is the land of Nubia. They have a lot of gold there. I hear they've also built pyramids of their own. In the past, our pharaohs have captured Nubians and brought them back here. Sometimes we've even hired them to be in our armies because they're excellent warriors and archers. Egypt's relationship with Nubia feels a little like my relationship with my brothers. We're very close. Sometimes we fight each other, and sometimes we get along really well. Well, that's a bit about our neighbors. What else can I tell you about our country? Egyptians believe that people have a cycle of life, like the cycles of nature that we see around us. The sun rises and sets, only to rise again the next day. Every year our crops go strong, and we harvest them. Then the plants die, and we wait for new ones to sprout again the next season. We think that when people die, they will come back to life again too, just like the sun rises and the plants grow. So when people die, we preserve their bodies so they can live again when they join Osiris, god of the next world. It is a very specialized job. Everything must be exactly right or the process won't work. First, we remove the internal organs. Then we cover the body with special salt called natron. This dries the body out 
so it can be preserved. After around 40 days, we fill the body with good smelling spices, rub the skin with oils, and wrap it with bandages. Then the body is placed inside a coffin for its final trip across the river. In Egypt, we believe that the land of the setting sun is the land of the dead, so most of our tombs are on the west side of the Nile. These days, our pharaohs and important people are buried in the Valley of the Kings, across from Thebes. Before sealing the tomb, we perform the opening of the mouth ceremony. This restores the powers of sight and speech to the body, so it can live forever in paradise with Osiris. Well, I have to say, I'd be pretty happy to just live forever right here in Egypt. What a great place. We've taken the Nile's gift of fertile land and created an amazing country. We developed irrigation and a really accurate calendar to track the floods. We created papyrus and two different writing systems. And we figured out how to work together to build our huge pyramids and temples. Everything I've seen and learned on this trip has made me proud to be an Egyptian. I can't wait to get home and tell everyone all about it.